and free on all platforms. Come on, Kirk, give me your hand. Heart-stopping video tonight of Florida police pulling a nine-year-old from a burning home by breaking a window. The boy's mother and boyfriend had already safely made it out of the home. The child in the hospital recovering from serious burns. And the breaking news tonight, a confirmed tornado touching down in Michigan. The severe weather system making its way across the country tonight. And behind it, extreme heat. Rob Marciano standing by with it all. Tonight, growing concerns about the spike in COVID cases heading into the summer. The U.S. reporting 700,000 new COVID cases in the last week. The number of counties at moderate or high risk more than doubling. And the new concerns for children, even as the CDC has paved the way for booster shots, now going into the arms of 5 to 11-year-olds. President Biden's high-stake Asia trip now underway. The president in South Korea, as there is increasing speculation, North Korea may test a long-range missile while he is there. Mary Bruce is with the president tonight. The first visible signs of easing in that nationwide baby formula shortage. Hundreds of pallets from overseas expected to arrive in some states as soon as this weekend. When will you find that formula on store shelves? The concerning new monkeypox outbreak is growing. 11 countries that normally don't have the disease now dealing with suspected cases, including the U.S. What you need to know. And award-winning director and producer Judd Apatow joins us to talk about his new documentary on comedian George Carlin. What he says he learned from the legendary comedian. I'm always inspired by someone who does maybe their best work near the end of their career. That conversation and more coming up. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us tonight. We're going to begin with the promise and the peril of the pandemic. Today, young children took the first doses of Pfizer's booster shot after the CDC authorized use for 5 to 11-year-olds. With waning effectiveness from the first round of shots, the boosters could provide another layer of protection for young Americans. And that protection is needed as troubling signs emerge of a potential summer surge. Positive COVID cases have risen steadily for the past six weeks. And today, 45% of all Americans are living in counties considered at medium or high risk of transmission. Those rising cases could once again bring an on again, off again debate over wearing masks indoors just months after people were relieved to take them off and return to some semblance of normalcy. But with so many looking to put the pandemic in the rearview mirror, putting masks back on could be a tall order. So we begin tonight with ABC's Wick Johnson tracking the latest in the fight against the pandemic. Across the country today, the first kids 5 to 11 getting their booster shots. You shouldn't be nervous. It's just a little pinch. It just takes like a sec. The CDC director signing off on the extra dose for young children at least five months after their initial COVID shots. It's helpful so like you don't get sick from the coronavirus. It comes amid growing fears of a possible summer surge. The number of counties at high COVID risk there in orange doubling to nearly 300 in just the last week. 45% of Americans are now living in a medium or high risk area. We are seeing a swell in cases. When you have a sheer number of volume of cases that are being infected, that's going to translate into more hospitalizations, unfortunately more deaths. The FDA set to decide by early July on a new and improved vaccine expected to roll out in the fall, one that would last longer and better target Omicron and its subvariants. For now, the CDC is strengthening its booster recommendation, saying immunocompromised Americans over 12 and everyone over 50 should get their second booster shot. We have a lot of infection out there right now. And what I am recommending to basically everybody over 50 uh, is given how much infection there is, given that, that extra layer of protection that the second booster offers, uh, that there's no reason to wait. People should go out and get that second shot. And in those areas of high transmission, the CDC again telling people to wear masks indoors. The city of Philadelphia bringing back a mask mandate in schools. I always want to be safe and I always want to make sure my family's safe. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that the school district needs to like do whatever they can to make sure that their students are safe. 
Right, safety key here. Whit Johnson joins me now. Whit, health officials are also tracking a series of cases of hepatitis in children, trying desperately to figure out whether it's connected to COVID at all. Yeah, Phil, the CDC now says that a sixth child has died in the U.S. of this rare and severe form of hepatitis. Health officials are investigating 180 cases across the country. They want to know whether they're possibly linked to a prior COVID infection, adenovirus, or whether COVID quarantines may have left these children more vulnerable to other viruses over the last few years. Phil. All right, Whit Johnson, thank you. And now to the severe weather pounding parts of the country tonight. A confirmed tornado touching down in Michigan. Alex Perez reports. Tonight, a massive tornado touching down in Michigan, debris swirling in the air. People seen running for cover with the twister bearing down. We have a major tornado strike here. Video just in showing the utter devastation left behind in Gaylord. Buildings ripped apart, state police warning people to avoid the area. Businesses along this street suffering heavy damage. Looks like part of Hobby Lobby roof is gone. Authorities issuing a tornado warning late this afternoon, urging residents to take shelter immediately. One hospital in the area confirming they're treating the injured. So far, no word on any fatalities due to the storm. Alex Perez, thank you so much. Let's get straight to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who is tracking this severe weather and the extreme heat set to hit part of the country this weekend. Hey, Rob. Hi, Phil. The energy that dropped that tornado in Michigan is going to be heading east and spreading out as it does so as it bumps in to this record-breaking uh, heat, a heat dome in some respects, and that's only going to aggravate the situation. Look at what we expect for severe thunderstorms tomorrow. It's a wide area from central Texas, Austin to Dallas, Little Rock, Arkansas, through the heartland and through Indianapolis, Cleveland, and all the way up into the uh, northern New England. Damaging winds possible with some of these storms. There'll be slow movers, scattered hail, and maybe a tornado or two as we saw in, uh, in parts of Michigan today. All right, here's the heat it'll be bumping into. 92 degrees in Dallas, Abilene, and Childress. You hit not 107 degrees uh, yesterday. That, that area will cool down a little bit, and it's going to snow in Denver, by the way. Uh, temperatures will be in the 90s all the way through Charleston and all the way up into the Northeast big cities. 97 tomorrow in Philadelphia, but look at New York and Boston will easily hit 90. It looks like during the day on Sunday, if Philly hits 97 tomorrow, Phil, that will tie an all time record for the warmest temperature recorded in May. So uh, very unusual stuff for this time of year. Yeah, not Phil. a lot of spring. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. You bet. Now to the mad dash to get formula back on U.S. shelves. It continues. Operation Fly Formula is underway with the first shipments expected to arrive from overseas in just days. But in the meantime, desperate parents are still scrambling to figure out how to get their little ones fed. ABC's Maria Villarreal brings us this report. Tonight, Operation Fly Formula preparing to take off with the first flight expected to arrive in the U.S. from Switzerland in just days. I don't think it's going to be very long uh, before that flight is actually uh, in the air. With President Biden invoking the Defense Production Act, the Defense Department now in charge of transporting the equivalent of 1.5 million bottles of formula from a Nestle plant in Zurich to Plainfield, Indiana. The first shipment containing three specialized formula that help babies with cow's milk protein allergies. The shortage triggered by supply chain issues, then worsened by a February recall by formula maker Abbott. In Spokane, Brianna Mullen heading to four different stores by bus in search of a special formula for her two-month-old and coming home empty-handed. I'd gotten one can for my friend and now it's like once that can's gone, you know, I don't, who knows if we're going to be able to find another can. Here in Texas, nearly half of the baby formula supply out of stock. The North Texas Mother's Milk Bank in Fort Worth now looking for a way to help meet the urgent need. We have had um, at one point this week in a 24 hour period over 70 mothers make inquiries on how they could become donors, which is phenomenal. Maria joins us now. Maria, what's being done to get that donated milk processed and then to those who need it most? So, Phil, you can see it right behind me. These lab techs, they are working overtime right now. The hope is that they are able to process as much of the donated milk that is coming in as possible so that they can get it out to struggling families that need to feed their babies maybe as early as next week. But still, they are working out the kinks in this process right now. All right, Maria, thank you.
Now to the growing concern about monkeypox, a rare African disease that seems to be spreading in Europe and now in the U.S. New York is reporting what may be the second U.S. case of monkeypox, and six more people are being monitored after possible exposure. So what exactly is monkeypox, and what is the risk? Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, the CDC warning doctors to be on the lookout for symptoms of monkeypox as health officials investigate a second possible American infection in New York City, part of a global outbreak of 130 confirmed or suspected cases in 11 countries where the virus is rarely found. It's the most important outbreak in the history of monkeypox uh, globally because we're seeing cases in multiple countries at the same time. This has never happened before. Monkeypox is a viral infection typically found in Africa from the same family as smallpox, causing flu-like symptoms and sometimes covering the body with blisters. While it can be deadly, it's rare and most patients recover. The virus does not spread easily between humans and previous outbreaks often fizzled out quickly. I think people just have to be curious, aware, but not terrified, not panicked not change any plans or travel. And Phil, because this virus typically is located in Africa, in usual circumstances, any cases that's located elsewhere is the result of people who just traveled from Africa. In this instance, this is a very unique outbreak for experts because number one, there's a lot of cases in different countries at the same time. And also that confirmed case in Massachusetts was from someone who only traveled to Canada and back. This has a lot of experts particularly focused on that case, and the hope is that this virus hasn't evolved to be more transmissible or be able to transmit in a different way. Phil? All right, Trevor Alt, thank you. Now to the high-stakes presidential trip happening in Asia. President Biden is in South Korea tonight. The trip, an opportunity to reassure allies of America's commitment to countering China and managing North Korea's nuclear threat. Senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce is traveling with the president. President Biden in South Korea touring a semiconductor plant. President Biden, President Yoon. Reinforcing the economic ties between our two countries amid supply chain delays and the growing threat of China. The alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States of America is a linchpin of peace, stability and prosperity. With Biden's attention dominated lately by the war in Ukraine, this trip, his first to Asia since taking office, is a chance to reassure allies and stress his commitment to countering the rise of China. Our strategy is to build around strengthening our ties and cooperation across the board. Also top of mind, the dictator next door. U.S. officials warning there's a real risk North Korea's Kim Jong-un could launch another long-range missile or even conduct a nuclear test during Biden's visit. An unprecedented provocation that could come even as North Korea is facing a COVID crisis. Earlier this week, a rare sighting of Kim in a mask. The regime now acknowledging its first COVID outbreak, reporting at least 2.2 million people are sick. But the dictator is still resisting most outside assistance and refusing vaccines. Mary Bruce joins us now from South Korea. Mary, a bit of news before the president even arrived there where you are in South Korea. Two members of the Secret Service sent back home after an incident with local police. Yeah, we've learned that two members of the Secret Service who are assigned to prepare for this trip went out for a night of drinking before President Biden arrived. They became intoxicated and apparently got into an altercation with a cab driver. A police report was filed with local authorities. These two uh, officials have now been immediately sent back home and have been placed on administrative leave, Phil. And Mary, the threat from North Korea, obviously a top concern for South Korea. Any word whether the president will visit the demilitarized zone? It may come as a surprise, but the White House says he does not plan to make a visit to the DMZ. They note that President Biden has been uh, several times before as a senator and as vice president. And they say this time around, instead of going to the DMZ, that the president wanted to go to see, quote, where the rubber hits the road, where, where you can actually see U.S. and Korean uh, service members serving side by side, working together. So instead, he's going to be visiting another air base here in Seoul. But it, it does also fit in line, I think, with this administration's policy and their sort of attitude towards North Korea, which has largely been to try and not give Kim Jong-un any additional attention. It certainly is a break uh, from the previous president. And so not going to the DMZ, not having those images of the president looking through the binoculars over across the border certainly seems in line with their overall strategy, Phil. Mary Bruce reporting in from South Korea. Mary, thank you.
And now to the war in Ukraine, where tonight Russia is declaring the city of Mariupol now fully in their control. Fiercest fighting has now moved to the eastern Donbass region. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reports tonight from Kyiv. Tonight, new video of a dramatic firefight as the three-month Russian siege of the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol finally draws to an end. Pro-Russian forces releasing the video appearing to target the tunnels where Ukrainian fighters were holed up. ABC News unable to confirm when it was taken. The Kremlin claiming it now has full control of the city. And tonight, President Zelensky posting video of a strike on a concert hall in the northeast of Ukraine, calling it absolute evil. Seven people killed, including an 11-year-old child. We saw the horrors in Butcher firsthand. Anna nearly crippled when she tried to escape Butcher. Her husband Anton killed when Russian soldiers sprayed their car with bullets. I only have this image of his face on the uh, steering wheel. Uh, totally in blood. Anna, pregnant at the time and badly wounded in the attack, lost her unborn son. Um, I was waiting for this child and uh, it was awful what happened. And Tom Sufi Burridge joins us now. Tom, so much heartbreak over there, but you say you've also witnessed countless moments of resiliency every day there. Phil, earlier in the week, we spoke to a man who was on the phone with his son as his son and his wife and his daughter fled their family home. The Russians opened fire. He was killed while talking to his father on the phone. We then met a Ukrainian policeman in a town near from here, and he lost six members of his family in a Russian missile strike. He lost his 15-month-old daughter, his wife, his brother, his mum, his dad and his grandma when their home was hit. And then Anna, who you saw there. Anna is an incredibly brave, resilient young woman. And for me, she represents the resilience of Ukraine right now in the face of a brutal war. Phil? So much devastation, but resilience, as you point out. Tom, thank you. It is the latest blow to the Biden administration's handling of the border crisis. A federal judge ordered they continue implementing Title 42, which imposed pandemic-related restrictions at the border that effectively closed humanitarian relief options for asylum seekers. Joining me now with details on all of this is ABC's Matt Gutman. Matt, explain to us first how we got here. What has the timeline been like? It's a long story. Uh, Title 42 was fo first invoked by President Trump in March 2020. Uh, that was because of the COVID outbreak. Uh, they had thought that by invoking this um, public health emergency, they could limit the number of asylum seekers and limit the, the amount of COVID that was entering the country. Obviously, we know borders don't work to limit this virus. Um, last month, the Biden administration decided it was time to try to repeal Title 42. They were sued this month by uh, 24 Republican governors who wanted Title 42 to stay in place. The rationale being, they say, that it helps to limit the number of asylum seekers in the United States. Um, that's how we got to where we are. What does this mean? That's a different question. Basically, the judge in Louisiana's injunction keeps the status quo, right? It says the Biden administration can't change Title 42, can't repeal it until this lawsuit winds its way through court or there's some sort of negotiated solution. So right now it's staying in place. They had hoped it would re be repealed by Monday. That's not looking possible at this point, Phil. Matt, you covered the border quite a bit for us over the last few years. You know this issue inside and out. So tell us what kind of impact Title 42 has realistically had. We're not quite sure. We don't know. And it's really hard to assess that. Um, look at the numbers we've had from last April, this April, 234,000 migrants apprehended or stopped at the border. A record number, never been that high by a large margin, right? Um, is 180 some percent higher than the month before. So the numbers are increasing. So it doesn't actually make sense that Title 42 has worked um, to make people more disinclined uh, to try to cross into the United States. And there is some belief that it might actually do the opposite, because when you try to come in illegally under Title 42 and you get um, extradited or kicked out uh, back across the border, there's nothing permanent on your record so you could keep trying again. Um, it's a very complicated topic. The bottom line is nobody really knows 
if it works for sure. Um, and the Biden administration has also increased the number of people who can actually enter the United States. Um, around Title 42 to try to help people who are asylum seekers get in when they have legitimate claims. So this is very complicated and it's probably going to persist as a hot topic button, uh, to hot topic issue uh, for quite some time, Phil. Complicated indeed and passionate opinions on both sides of yeah. the issue. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, and we have just learned that the DOJ plans on appealing this decision. The White House also releasing a statement saying it disagrees with the Title 42 ruling, but will comply with it while at the same time planning for its eventual end. So we started this week with the horror of that deadly racist mass shooting in Buffalo, where 10 people were murdered while shopping at a grocery store. And today, the first of those victims was laid to rest. A private ceremony was held for Hayward Patterson. He was a church deacon who died while ferrying members of his congregation to the grocery store. The funerals for at least five others who were gunned down are scheduled over the next week. We turn next to reports that the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas sought to overturn the 2020 election results. In newly released emails, Ginny Thomas urges Republican lawmakers in Arizona to choose, quote, a clean slate of electors, attributing Biden's victory to fraud. ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, with details. Newly revealed emails show that as President Trump was calling on the Supreme Court to overturn the election. We'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's going to end up perhaps at the highest court in the land. Hopefully they will do what's right for our country. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was actively urging Republicans to overturn Joe Biden's election victory in at least one key state, Arizona. In emails first reported by The Washington Post and confirmed by ABC News, Jenny Thomas urged the top Republican in the Arizona state legislature to overturn the will of the state's voters, replacing electoral votes won by Joe Biden with a slate of Trump electoral votes, writing, quote, you have the power to fight back against fraud. Please take action to ensure a clean slate of electors is chosen. Mrs. Thomas sent a similar email to at least one other Arizona Republican lawmaker, warning, quote, consider what will happen to the nation we all love if you don't stand up and lead. And John Carl joins us now. John, we've previously learned that Ginny Thomas wasn't just reaching out to Republicans in Arizona about overturning the election. Yeah, there was a lot more here, uh, Phil. Uh, as you remember, uh, when the Mark Meadows emails that were obtained uh, by the January 6th committee found, uh, came out, we learned that Ginny Thomas had been emailing quite extensively with the then Trump chief of staff, Mark Meadows, during this period after the election, urging him uh, to do everything possible to overturn the election results and saying that Donald Trump must never concede. Uh, after this latest uh, revelation today, we reached out to both Mrs. Thomas and to her lawyer and have not heard anything in response to this. Phil? All right, John Carl, thanks so much. When we come back, the daring rescue 42 stories above the ground. Our conversation with actor-director Judd Apatow about a new project he's working on. But up next, how well does the Tesla autopilot feature work? We examine the new documentary on Hulu exploring that issue. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Turning now to the controversy surrounding Tesla's autopilot system. Through Tesla's innovation, the company came up with an advanced assisted driving program and later an autopilot feature that drives your car for you. This autonomous feature was promoted by Elon Musk to be a safer way to drive. But the new FX New York Times documentary, Elon Musk's Crash Course, looks at the dangers of this kind of automation. The film draws on firsthand accounts from people who were a part of creating the technology, those who used it, and details the lives lost. Joining us now is producer and director of the film, Emma Schwartz, and New York Times reporter, Cade Metz. Thank you both for joining us. Emma, we'll start with you. Uh, what piqued your interest in creating this particular documentary and what was the process like? Yeah, so, you know, Elon Musk is, you know, one of the most famous, wealthiest, and prominent business entrepreneurs of our time. And, you know, we're trying to look and understand uh, what, what story could we tell about him? And one of the things that really caught my attention was there were a lot of these questions going on about the autopilot technology and the efforts to create a self-driving car. You know, here we have this visionary tech technology leader and, you know, the government was starting to look into potential safety concerns and we wanted to dig in further. Cade, we all in the media have been following, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, through the journey of the company, but you had a focus specifically on this. Was there anything that surprised you throughout your reporting on Tesla's autopilot? I think what's most surprising is uh, how misunderstood the technology is. Um, for years, uh, people like Musk, um, people across the industry, but Musk in particular, painted uh, things like autopilot as something that would be able to drive your car anywhere by 2018, by 2019, by 2020. Um, none of that happened, obviously, but it was shocking, and to a degree, it's still shocking. Um, how many people still believe that this is a technology that's on the verge of doing what he says it will? Uh, the reality is that it won't. Cade, you've reported on Musk's grand vision for Tesla for years. So give us a sense of Elon Musk, the person. We know he's really eccentric. We hear his speeches. But talk about his ambition and how it affected the mission to create this technology. His mission... Um, it, you know, and his attitude is is extreme, right? He he has he has a vision for um, not only cars um, but rockets, um, artificial intelligence, um, interfaces for the human brain and and machines. These are all things that are in the distant future, but he talks about them as if they're in the present, um, and he talks about them with such conviction. You can't help but believe what he's saying. This is a, a common attitude 
um, a common method, if subconscious in, in Silicon Valley, but he takes it to extremes. Um, and regardless of um, what is reported about the realities of his technology, about the realities of his management style, about the realities of his companies, um, he manages to instill this confidence um, in a, at least a certain part of the population, um, a very, very intense, um, very, very committed group of people uh, who follow his every word and repeat his every word. Yeah, and at the very least, you believe he believes what he's telling you. He, he's, he's good in, in convincing people that way. He really seems to believe it. Uh, this is a good point in, in the interview to, to point out that Tesla has repeatedly stood by its autopilot system and has claimed its safety reports show that it is less prone uh, to accidents than normal driving. So Emma, you follow people who have used Tesla's autopilot and detail the deaths of those who died using it. And the documentary mentions uh, with regard to Tesla specifically, since autopilot came out a few years ago, several people have died and dozens of crashes have happened using Tesla's self-driving system. So. I would imagine speaking to those people for a documentary like this is so important to bring a face uh, to what can happen. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to talk to people who use the technology, who love the technology, who've had questions about the technology, and, you know, also been impacted by the technology. So, you know, part of what we get into the film is looking at, you know, the first known autopilot related fatality in the United States, which killed a man named Joshua Brown. And, you know, his accident was really the first one that sparked a lot of interest from the government and investigators to understand, um, you know, the limits of the technology and to, to evaluate, you know, what more could be done to make these sorts of systems safer. Uh, you mentioned earlier this question of, you know, the data that Tesla puts out. And, you know, we've, we looked at that as well and we discussed that in the documentary um, because, you know, Elon has cited it many times saying autopilot, uh, I think most recently he's claimed that it's 10 times safer than, you know, a human driver. The, the challenge with that data is that it's very limited and it's not been vetted by outside sources. And so, you know, from from an outside perspective, it's it's hard to know because we don't have enough data. What's really safe? You know, could it be that some parts of autopilot make things safer? That's possible. But what we have seen is there's certainly been collateral damage where there may be unintended consequences, and there have been um, recommendations from the government on how to potentially limit those consequences. All right. Well, he's a fascinating guy, and this certainly is, certainly is a fascinating look into him and this technology. Emma Cade, thank you both for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Their new FX New York Times documentary, Elon Musk's Crash Course, airs tonight on Hulu at 10 p.m. Pacific. We should mention that ABC News did reach out to Tesla for comment regarding this documentary, but we have not received a response. However, we are learning tonight that a judge has ruled that a Tesla driver will have to stand trial for a crash that led to the death of two people while in the car was in autopilot. The driver was charged with vehicular manslaughter for this 2019 accident that happened out in LA. Prosecutors say auto assist features in the car were active and that the driver's hands were on the wheel, but that he never touched the brakes around the time of the crash and was speeding and ignoring signs to slow down. And the driver has pleaded not guilty. Still ahead here on Prime, if you're wondering, like most everybody else in this country, how high gas prices could go this summer, you are not alone. We will ask the experts. The royal premiere for Top Gun 2. And you won't believe how much this Mercedes sold for. No, seriously, it's an incredible price. But first, our tweet of the day, and it's from us to you. Thank you for streaming with us on this first ever National Streaming Day. black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live.
is the crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. Going once, going twice, sold. The most expensive car in the world. A 1955 Mercedes now has that title. Here are the details by the numbers. $142.8 million. That's how much an anonymous bidder paid for the 300 SLR Ulanout Coupe at a private auction earlier this month. It is one of only two in the world and is regarded as one of the most prized cars in auto history. The 300 SLR could reach speeds of 180 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest road legal cars of its time. Back then, German cars could barely break 125. Prior to the sale, $70 million was the most ever paid for a car. That was for a 1963 Ferrari GTO. Mercedes-Benz says the proceeds from this particular sale will be seed money for a scholarship fund for university and school-age students studying environmental science. We still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The millions potentially affected by COVID in one of the world's most isolated nations. And our VIP tour of arguably the most famous clock in the world. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. 
Lynch revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. American kids ages 5 to 11 now getting extra protection from COVID-19. The CDC director signing off on booster shots for the age group, saying they must wait at least five months after their initial shots. This as vaccines show waning protection against symptomatic infections across all age groups, from 60% after two doses, down to 20% a few months later. But experts say they still protect against severe disease. The country averaging more than 100,000 new COVID-19 COVID cases a day, infections quadrupling in the last six weeks. 25,000 patients in the hospital, the highest number since mid-March. In the last week, 46 states and territories have reported increases in hospital admissions of at least 10%. President Biden in South Korea, starting his first trip to Asia as commander in chief. Biden meeting with President Yoon at the world's largest semiconductor factory. And Samsung is building a similar plant in Texas, in line with Biden's push for homegrown manufacturing. Mr. Biden also noting the supply chain crisis has created a shortage of semiconductors, which has increased costs for cars and other goods. And that Russia's war in Ukraine is showing the need to secure critical supply chains. These little chips, only a few nanometers thick are the key to propelling us into the next era of humanity's technological development. South Korea is the first stop on Biden's two-country visit to Asia. Also in the president's sights, North Korea. Pyongyang has ramped up its missile testing in the weeks leading up to this trip. Our intelligence does reflect the genuine possibility that there will be long-range missile tests or a nuclear test in the days leading into, on, or after uh, the president's trip to the region. Drivers are hoping someone can pump the brakes on rising gas prices as experts sound the alarm about a possible summer surge on the way. Analysts with J.P. Morgan Chase are now predicting $6 a gallon gas by August. That would be a 30% increase from the current national average. As problems persist with the fuel supply chain, just as more Americans prepare to hit the road for summer travel. California has already surpassed the $6 mark, averaging $6.06 a gallon for regular. The rest of the country is averaging an all-time high of $4.59 a gallon. A majority of people admit gas prices are affecting their vacation plans. One survey found 70% of Americans say their travel plans have changed because of rising gas prices, an increase of 24% compared to last year. Two window washers needing rescue high up in New York City. They were 42 stories up on a high rise when a mechanical issue stopped their scaffolding from going up and down. Firefighters cut open a glass window of the building and were able to pull both of them inside to safety. They were probably the calmest people on the scene. They handled it really well. Naomi Osaka facing the media before this year's French Open. For the most part, I, I think I'm, I'm okay. This one year after the former world number one vowed not to do any press during last year's tournament, citing her mental health, skipping the media day and her press conference following her first round win, leading to a $15,000 fine. She eventually withdrew before the second round, later sitting out Wimbledon and taking a break after the U.S. Open. Osaka admitted she's still nervous about this year's tournament, but that her experience has been positive so far. Of course, I also didn't like how I handled the whole situation but I was worried that there was people that I offended some way and I would just like you know kind of <laughs> bump into them but I think like everyone's been really positive for the most part. 
ABC News' Mona Koser Abdi recently sat down with Emmy Award-winning director, producer, and screenwriter Judd Apatow to discuss his new two-part documentary series, George Carlin's American Dream, premiering tonight on HBO Max. The documentary explores Carlin's journey to stand-up and how he became known as the dean of counterculture comedy. He changed comedy three or four times, and he's still talking to us. Was a rebel. Can't educate our young people, can't get health care to our old people, but we can bomb out of your country, all right. Judd Aptow, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to name some of your titles. You're okay. director, producer, screenwriter, author, probably so much more. But I do want to talk about this new documentary that you directed titled George Carlin's American Dream. And part one of the documentary actually starts with highlighting how so relevant today much of his commentary still is, particularly his commentary on abortion rights, for example. Here's another question I have. How come when it's us, it's an abortion, and when it's a chicken, it's an omelet? <laughs> so how do you think that his material has stayed so relevant over the decades, and why revisit it? I think he wasn't a comedian who talked about what was going on that day. So he didn't do a lot of jokes about, you know, the president at the time. I mean, he has a couple of Sandinista jokes, a couple of Reagan references, but for the most part, he's philosophical, and he's talking about the big issues and the big ideas. Over the several decades, um, he reinvented himself as a stand-up comedian. There are a lot of big-name comedians that are in this documentary. For example, Jerry Seinfeld. I'm very, I'm very glad to be here. Chris Rock. We need some bullet control. <laughs> we need to main, we need to control the bullets. That's right. I think all bullets should cost five thousand dollars. John Stewart. We have so many weapons, and I'm not afraid of retaliation from other countries because we are very strong. I'm sure we'll all be saved by the emergency broadcast system. I'm not worried about it. How has George Carlin inspired those comedians? I think that for people our age, like, he was big in the 70s. And so he was one of the first people who had, like, amazing comedy albums. He's breaking down language, all the words you're not allowed to say or you'll get in trouble. They arrested me for profanity. The Supreme Court restricts the broadcast of dirty words. The iconic seven bad words that you can't yes. use. Um, how has George Carlin inspired you? Well, I mean, first of all, just his courage. I mean, he took on the big ideas. And I think that he also was great for basically, you know, 50 years. And I think... You know, as I get a little older, you think, how do you not get crusty and how do you not repeat yourself? So I'm always in inspired by someone who does maybe their best work near the end of their career. What's really interesting to me about this documentary, though, it doesn't just talk about George Carlin, the comedian. It touches on some darker points in his life. Why highlight the good and the bad? Well, I think with these kind of documentaries, what I'm interested in is, you know, what happened to someone as a kid? What trauma did they go through that made them want to be a comedian? Mm -hmm. And then how did that changed the type of community they became. And now the drugs are there. And that really did undermine everything in our family. I did as much cocaine as there was in the immediate three county area at that time. <laughs> he had collapsed in on himself. My career began to wane. I had to find my voice. Part of the story is he, mm -hmm. he met his wife Brenda at a comedy club in the Midwest and they got married very quickly in 1960. But you know, due to you know the times, she stayed home with, with their daughter Kelly and really was denied the ability to pursue her own dreams because he was on the road trying to be a, a comedian. And she became an alcoholic, and he had terrible cocaine addiction. That's part of the story of the documentary is how George and Brenda found each other again and got over their addictions. Another big project for you, your latest book. Mm -hmm. It is the sequel to Sick in the Head, Sicker in the Head. How did you push the conversation forward? Well, we were doing it during the pandemic, and a lot of these people were just stuck at home. So I went after people like Lynn manuel Miranda and, and David Letterman and Whoopi Goldberg because I thought just their home. It was definitely a vulnerable moment for people. So I think the, the interviews are much more intimate because of that. They can't say no because they're not busy, right? They're just stuck at home? They usually could lie to me and just say, I got to <laughs> be on set. But there's no set. So, no so I took advantage of that. Um, but because of that, as you mentioned, the conversations were a lot more intimate, mm -hmm. a lot more personal. Yeah. How do you get people to open up to you? I think that it, it's like talking to uh, someone who has the same job. So when I was a kid, I would interview people, but it was like, how do you do it? How do you get in? Mm -hmm. And now it's really just like, how are you doing? Like, how are you holding up? Are you happy? Are you stressed out? You know, why did you get in this business? And is it what you want it to be? 
you're talking to a lot of new era entertainers yeah. as well. Um, how, how has that shaped the way the book came together? Well, I thought with the first book, it was really a lot of like my heroes growing up. And that's the people who were around like in the early 1980s. But with this book, I tried to spread out and make it like way more diverse because I realized that when I was growing up, I saw myself on TV. So I could see Jerry Seinfeld on TV and think, oh, I could do that. But for so many comedians, they didn't see like their culture represented in comedy. So I wanted to talk to people like Mindy Kaling and Rami Youssef and Amber Ruffin to say, you know, what, what was the experience like for you not having that to try to figure out how to get into comedy and what you wanted to express as a comedian? As you continue this project and you talk to so many more people, what do you learn about yourself through this process? Uh, well, I, I genuinely learned that we're all very similar. You know, uh, I, I think in comedy, you know, something happens to you and it makes you compassionate or overly sensitive. You just start paying attention. And I think George Carlin is like that. He just thought, can you trust the, the government? Can you trust, uh, you know, big business? And I think that's what happens to a lot of comedians. They go through something and they just give everything a second look. Judd Apatow, thank you so much. Thank you. And Mona, thank you. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. North Korea reporting more than 2 million people, quote, sickened with fever as of Thursday evening. A big jump, huge jump from last week when the secretive nation acknowledged its first suspected cases of COVID-19. North Korean state-run Korean Central News Agency is still not referring to the outbreak as COVID-19, likely because there are no test kits to diagnose patients. Since the coronavirus pandemic swept across the globe in 2020, North Korea has completely closed off from the outside world in an effort to stop the virus from entering its borders. Sales of the hijab in Kabul are picking up as women in Afghanistan grapple with the now new order, uh, how it would practically be enforced, with some joining protests expressing their opposition to it. Last week, the Taliban ordered women to cover their faces in public a return to their past hardline rule and an escalation of restrictions on girls and women. If they disobey, a woman's closest male family member can be held accountable. Britain's Prince William and wife Kate attended the British premiere of Top Gun Maverick in London. The couple met Tom Cruise and other members of the cast. The film is set to debut in theaters on May 27th. After five years, one of the world's most iconic towers is finally opened again, and Maggie Rooley got a first look inside the clock tower of Big Ben, also in London. And she is bringing us along for the tour. It's the great clock on everyone's British bucket list. Kids, Big Ben, Parliament, again. And now, for the first time since 2017, the iconic clock tower is once again shining, scaffolding free, fresh with a hundred million dollar renovation. And we're getting an up close look. All right, we've got 334 steps to Big Ben. Come on. Going up and up until finally. Oh my gosh! This is it. This is, we're inside behind Big Ben right now. Take a look at this. This is when you know you're really behind something special. When you look up at Big Ben, you always notice that beautiful clock face. Originally designed as the biggest and most accurate clock in the world in 1843, Matthew Hamlin, the chair of the restoration project, says the goal was to return the clock to its Victorian glory with a few modern touches. All the glass has been completely replaced. There are 324 pieces. These will be the new lights that illuminate the dials from behind. One surprise, discovering the 14-foot-long hands on the clock face weren't black, but actually a vibrant Prussian blue. Every single one of the more than 1,000 components that make up the beating heart of Big Ben were removed and cleaned, the first time in the clock's nearly 200-year history. Oh, is that it working right there? Yes, and that <gasps> is the pendulum, which, as you can see, is swinging to and fro. <laughs> that is regulating the time. No electricity, no battery. This massive clock is powered by nothing but gravity and accurate down to the second. So here's a question for you. What's more accurate, Big Ben or a phone? Well, obviously I'm going to say Big Ben because <laughs> this is regulated to an inch of its life and we have also had 160 years experience of keeping it accurate. And then one more flight up. Oh my gosh, look at that. Wow. Big Ben in real life. Wow, it's a, uh, they didn't lie, it's big. 
The tower is made up of five bells weighing in at 21 tons, attached by wire to the clock below, striking with precision every 15 minutes, with Big Ben chiming on the hour. As Adam Wotrowski, the principal architect, puts it, Big Ben is the heartbeat of London. What is so special about this bell? It was the only bell allowed to strike during the Second World War, so it became the voice of liberty and hope. So that cemented its fame. What a great tour. Maggie, thank you. And finally, to a story of perseverance and inspiration from a modern-day jazz man. Our Will Gans doing his best to end the week on a high note. This is Brian Carter. Say it don't matter. A musician at the top of his game, described by the New York Times as a Juilliard-trained jazz prodigy. Though he might tell you otherwise. The thing about being a musician is that you're always a student and you're always trying to get better at, at the craft. You know, just like a basketball player or a football player, I'm just trying to get better. Brian earning his first Broadway credit, co-orchestrating the music for A Strange Loop, the most nominated musical this season. I got really lucky, it just kind of fell into my lap. My uh, good friend, Charlie Rosen, and then he was like, hey, Brian, can you uh, go to DC and, and just like fill in for me, you know? Uh, for a couple of weeks on the show, like be my associate orchestrator. And I was like, dude, yeah, absolutely. Don't get too shy. I saw the show and I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I got to be a part of, you know, the, the Broadway run as well, um, contributing additional orchestrations. Brian was born with music in his bones. His father, also a musician. But music was an extracurricular for Brian until it wasn't. Around 17 years old, um, I had the opportunity to play at the Grammy Awards. I think that kind of confirmed for me but that this is what I need to do uh, with my life. Sitting on stage at the Grammys instead of sitting in Algebra 2 class, that's what did it for you? It was like, eh, which, which one is better? I think it's, uh, I'll take Grammys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And now, all these years later, Brian's got the most recent Album of the Year Grammy winner collaborating on Brian's own album, which drops next month. John Batiste is, uh, he's one of the writers on uh, on the album. Just seeing his success at, at the Grammys this year is really inspiring. You and I. You and I, the song John Batiste co-wrote with Brian was the first single off the upcoming album, I Believe. It has been a labor of love and it's been in the works for four and a half years now. The takeaway should be that there's no right way to figure out who you are. And when the album drops on June 3rd, Brian hopes he can remind people of what jazz should be. I, I love introducing young people to this music. They're like, that's jazz? I thought jazz was the elevator stuff. And I'm like, it can be, but it's this also, you know? There's nothing wrong with twerking to jazz. That's what I got to say. Okay, that's a first for that. Will Gans, thank you so much. Before we go tonight, let's show you the image of the day. We are about a week away from Memorial Day and this snow at a baseball game. But what's really crazy about this picture from Colorado Coors Field is that it came 24 hours after it was close to 90 degrees there. Up to two feet of snow is expected, as Rob tells us, across parts of the Rockies today. The game between the Mets and the Rockies was snowed out. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic.
He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News Live honors Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Recipe for change. Here now is Eva Pilgrim. Hello, I'm Eva Pilgrim, and welcome to the special edition of ABC News Live, Recipe for Change, all part of our network-wide celebration of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We're excited to bring you a taste of the colorful kaleidoscope that is AANHPI culture via the kitchen and the extraordinary culinary talents of some of America's leading names. First, to a Western landmark, a once booming mining town, the oldest continuously operated family-owned Chinese restaurant in America. Nightline co-anchor Juju Chang leads us off in Butte, Montana. Butte, Montana. Once the so-called richest hill on earth. A booming mining town in the late 1800s. And a destination for immigrants from around the world seeking their fortune in the mines, farms, and on the railroads. Today, the city is a shadow of its glory days, but there's still hints of the Old West. Here on Main Street, in Old Chinatown, a flickering sign of the Old East. Standing for over a century, the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains the oldest continuously running Chinese restaurant in America, and one of the last in Butte. How many Chinese restaurants were there, and how many are there now? There was at least a dozen in its height, mm -hmm. but now there's only one on Main Street and two at your traditional Chinese-Asian buffet. Jerry Tam is the fourth generation to own this living monument to Chinese-American history. First of all, Pekin, tell me about the history of the name. The name originally came from Peking, China, but... Which is now known as Beijing. Correct. <laughs> and the joke is, my father created this wonderful neon marquee sign, and he said, the G wouldn't fit. <laughs> so we're known as the Pekin. That's amazing. Parlor. The story of Pekin traces back to Tam's great great grandfather and great uncle opening the restaurant on the second floor of a tobacco and gaming parlor in 1911. So Hum Yao and my dad's great grandfather came from the same village and they partnered on this restaurant and they brought many businesses into view. Chinese laundry, Chinese tea, and all the gambling happened, the opium, and it all happened within the confines of this building. We had a mass influx of people and the Chinese helped build the railroads coming through Montana. So that helped with building Chinatown and all these little chow chow restaurants, including ours. But Pekin's specialty, just like the sign says, chop suey, an Americanized kitchen sink of odds and ends. So tell me, what's the signature recipe? Is it the chop suey or is it? So chop suey is, the definition is just tidbits. And so when the miners came in here at all hours of the morning, we were open basically 24 hours, we would run out of food. So the chefs in the uh, chow chows would just cut up anything, bean sprouts, celery, onions, just, you know, fillers cook it in its own vegetable gravy, and then serve it over fried chow mein noodles, and then serve it to the miners. Top with anything, any proteins, chicken, pork, beef, mushrooms, green peppers, onions, whatever they had. And that became an American staple, American chop suey. All right, so we've got, I see, celery, bean sprouts. Yeah. What else? Onion. Onion, lots of onion. I got a peek uh, inside the making of the what? famous Pekin chop suey. And now you're putting in yeah. cornstarch. Yeah. And that thickens it. Jerry and his four sisters practically lived in the restaurant, watching their charismatic dad, Danny Wong, build a community. 
After a finance degree and a thriving fashion career in New York City, Jerry returned to Montana to nurture his family's legacy. Your dad very much was a pillar of the community. What made him, do you think, transcend being Chinese American and just be a Montanan? And that's the best way to put it. Danny Wong wasn't Chinese. He was a beautiful.